Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you all today. It's great to be with the family always. It's good to see everyone. Today, as you can see the title on the screen, I've got a bold statement to talk about. Let's look into it. Let's start with looking at a quote. And this is a quote from a non-scriptural source, but I think it's an interesting way to look at things. So here's a quote from C.S. Lewis. And it says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play. But our merriment must be of the kind, and it is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have from the outset taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. And as you read this, I want you to pull out. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Have you ever thought about that statement? And what an incredible statement that is. If that is true, what does that mean for each of us? How do we see ourselves in each other? Or better yet, how about that person that gets under your skin and irritates you? How do you view them in light of that statement? What about our neighbor? Famous passage from Matthew, and I love this passage. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. And it reads, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord with your, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now think about that. We've... We've heard this verse many, many times. But how do you view your neighbor in light of that passage of you've never talked to a mere mortal? If that neighbor is an immortal being, does it make it easier to love them, have compassion on them, have patience with them, bear with their idiosyncrasies? And however, this is all great, but is you've never talked to a mere mortal right? Is that correct? Is that what God says? We're reading something that's written by a man, but does that hold up in the Bible? Can we find it in the Bible? Let's look. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. And this is eight verses, so bear with us. But 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of the sin is the law. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. Know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Notice that. In the twinkling of an eye, this mortality puts on immortality. We get to take our rightful form in that last trumpet sounds. So it looks like the answer is clearly a yes. If this is something important to understand, it's usually easy to find the concept more than one location. So let's see if we can find another verse that reinforces the confirms the understanding. You know, this isn't the movie Immortality we're talking about where you live here on Earth draft. We're talking about the immortality of our souls. So let's look for and see if we can find us another location. Let's turn to Romans 8, 12 through 18. Romans 8, 12 through 18. And it begins in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put on to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you see the spirit of adoption, which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in us. And notice that. The glory which should be revealed in us. Sons and daughters of the Almighty God. Joint heirs with Christ who sit to the right hand of God. Close enough to the Lord of the universe to claim Abba. In other words, Daddy. That's amazing. It makes you've never talked to a mere mortal seem like an understatement compared to what the you find in the Bible, right? So what does this mean? How do we use this? What good is knowing that you and everyone you've met is no mere mortal? How do you view others if you know that they are either immortal horrors or everlasting splendors? And now that we know what God says the same thing about us, let's look at the quote again and take a deeper look at it. Let's read it one more time. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to, mere, to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is the immortals with whom we joke, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. It does not mean we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of the kind, and is in fact the merriest kind. It is just between people who have from the outset taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, things that seem like they last for such a long time while we're on this earth are to be considered as the life of a gnat compared to our lives. If nations, cultures, arts, civilizations last about as long as a gnat's life compared to eternity, how do we view these things? Let's look at our nation. When I was a kid, I thought this nation was glorious. Looking out for what is right, helping those in need, fighting the good fights. And sometimes we do that. Sometimes we don't. In these last few years, this nation has treated families running for lives like criminals instead of guests who need our help and locked little kids in cages. We've abandoned our allies along the Turkish border and allowed them to be slaughtered. We're losing nearly 200,000 of our own citizens because of our stubborn, willful ignorance of the sickness. We're banned from travel from nearly every other country. We've seen the use of God's word as a prop for a photo op. We've seen supposedly religious leaders of large Christian colleges do things that are despicable for anyone, but even more so for someone who's supposed to lead young people to God. We've treated peaceful protesters with legitimate grievances like criminals and the enemy, and on and on and on. At other moments, like if anybody remembers the 1980 Winter Olympics, the hockey games, the game dubbed the, the Miracle on Ice, the nation's team triumphs over an enemy opponent that seems invincible, the Russian army, the Russian hockey team. It was not only an invincible enemy, it was also a geopolitical enemy. So it was, a, it was a victory that seemed, you know, more than it was. The people of the nation felt, all oh, this is great. Shining a miracle, you know. It's like this nation was in a beacon of spotlight. There's even a Disney movie made about it called Miracle, as you can see on the screen. But that's only a game. Very few of the nation's people who were in that game. That reflected glory only lasts a short time. This nation is filled with immortal souls. Just like every other nation, we are capable of incredible feats, glorious moments, incredible acts of kindness and caring. That is us as our best, as any immortal soul is best. We're also capable, capable of some pretty despicable and heinous acts, just like every other group of immortals. We have that choice. This nation is temporary. It is not immortal. It is not an heir of God. It is an artificial construct that we use to group ourselves and govern ourselves. This nation, like any other nation, is only as good as the immortals that live in it while they reside here on this earth. Allegiance to the nation should never come before allegiance to God. All things in this world are temporary. God is permanent. And let's look at a verse from the Bible, Luke 20, 
25. Luke 20, 25 reads, And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And this is when Jesus was talking to um, some folks about taxes. But there's a trick to this verse. Have you ever thought about everything is God's? Caesar's head may have been on the coin, but God, the creator, is the true owner of all things. The metal that the coin was created on, the energy and tools that created it. See, even Caesar's own soul and being came from God. <laughs> really, all things are God's. The immortal souls are the ones that matter. The part of us, the soul, that comes from God and is also permanent is what counts. And if you think about it, the nation, there's a, um, a quote from James Madison that kind of sums this up. This is um, from Friday, June 20th, 1788. In the Virginia Convention, they were assembled to debate a ratification of the federal constitution. And James Madison reminded his colleagues of the only ultimate safeguard of nation preservation. And he said this, but I go on this great Republican principle that the people will have virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render us secure. Suppose that any form of government will, be secu will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea. If there be sufficient virtue and intelligence in the community, it will be exercised in the selection of these men, so that we do not depend on their virtue or put confidence in our rulers, but in the people who are, are to choose them. A nation that's supposed to be a democracy is made of the people, the souls that are in that nation. Those are the ones that really count. And no matter where we live, no matter how crazy things get, love of God, love of our mortal neighbors is all that counts. It should guide us in what we should focus on. If this and any other nation's life is as short as a gnat's view of eternity, what should our view be? Our should be to love God. He has always been and always will be. Love your mortal neighbor. If we can reach them, they will be with us in eternity. If we don't, if they don't listen, eternity is a long time to miss someone. God's advice is practical for this life, but it also helps us with planning your neighborhood for the next million, billion, trillion, where you get the idea, that many years in advance. We want some of those other immortal souls to become everlasting splendors along with us. When you look at your neighbor and think of them putting on their uncomfortable mortality, what do you want that immortality to look like? Having as many of us as we know put on the glory and splendor that God wants us for us seems like a pretty good goal to strive for, right? And that brings us to the next part to look at. It is the mortals whom we work with, we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. When we say it was only one guy and I got mad at the highway, I just one guy I cursed out. I'll never see him again. I'll just take a bit more than my share. It doesn't matter who the next person is. As long as I'm all right, that's all that matters. I'll just leave this mess here. There's someone else to worry about. Now, read those statements again, and they'll ring pretty hollow if they're rephrased. I'll never see that immortal soul from the highway again. It doesn't matter who the next immortal creature is and if they are left without. I only care for my immortal soul and not the other immortal souls. They don't matter. Forget this mess. Some other immortal soul will have to worry about it. It's not the same, is it? And as a side note, kids, next time you leave a mess for your parents, think of it that way. <laughs> so with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. It is not this life, this moment, this period of time that matters. This life is that twinkling of an eye that Paul talks about. It goes by so very, very fast. Anyone who has a kid can tell you that very confidently. This life may seem like forever, especially in years like this one, when all that is going on, it may seem like it's taking forever for 2020 to come by. But for anyone who has a few decades under their belt, think back. Pick a major life event in your life. See how long ago it seems like that happened. For some, they may be far removed. It may seem like forever. But I'm willing to bet for some of them, it'll feel like just yesterday. 
it's been more than a decade and a half since I married Jeannie. But sometimes it feels like we walked out of the church a few days ago. These kids, two of them are old enough to be baptized. Just like they shouldn't be out of diapers. Now, compare our life to God's timeline of eternity. These events, this life, just a flash. This time we're going through, it's just a flash in it. Not even that. This period will pass. To everything, there is a time and a season. Even though it is hard to remember when things are in your face, we need to keep this perspective of Jesus. Jesus was always looking to eternity. He always focused on eternity, no matter what he was talking about. Even simple conversations about a drink of water, for example, were redirected to look at things from eternity from Jesus, from the perspective of Jesus. There's a passage in the Bible, John 4, 13 to 14. Jesus is talking to a lady about a drink of water. Simple drink of water, a glass of water. And below is the direction that Jesus took. Let's read this together. John 14, 13 to 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Simple conversation about water goes to the talking about everlasting souls, everlasting life. Every time you read what Jesus is talking about, that's always his focus. It should always be our focus. And if we stay focused on eternity, two things will happen. This period of time will be a lot more bearable. All things that happen won't get to us as much. We look at life as God wants us to. It circles back to the first part, as God showed us an example to Jesus for our own good. Coming back to with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Let's look at the second part of the quote that we started with. And the second part says, it does not mean that we are perpetually solemn. We must play. But our merriment must be the kind that is, and it is in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have from the outset taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. Now, notice how it says, no flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. And let's look at where that comes from in the Bible. If you turn me to Galatians 3, 26 through 29, I'll read there. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. As immortal souls, this is the case the whole time. But we don't see it until we actually are in Christ. It's how God wants us to see. It's how God allows us to see us and see each other. Imagine if we truly saw each other as God sees us. If we were immortal souls with an infinite timeline, there would be no protests. We wouldn't have treated each other in the first, mistreated each other in the first place. How glorious would that be if it's unthinkable to subject another immortal soul to pain, torment, or a needless death. That is how God would have us to be. That's how we should be. Taking this to a more practical role, note for our lives. The next time you stand in line, see someone else, interact with another immortal, stop and think. This is another immortal that I'm going to interact with. First, what an incredible chance God has given us. Second, truly see the other person for what they are, an immortal soul. The debates, the squabbles, the idiotic politics, and other distractions that people get so wrapped up in will seem so trivial in light of eternity. Today, at the close of service, when we can, the slides aren't showing and you can see each other, or even afterwards in your own home if you live with someone else, take a real look at the other immortal you see. Think to yourself, I'm looking at another immortal creature just like me. See if you treat that immortal differently. Do we listen a bit more to what they have to say? Do we care more about how that immortal is doing? Do we appreciate being with them? 
Do we let little things bother us so much anymore? Do we have more patience with them? In your marriage, with your kids, with your parents, grandparents, relatives, friends, co-workers, if we see them as fellow immortals, I'm willing to bet we'll treat them differently. If we also give the urgency to tell them about God's love a whole new spin, in the immortal horror or everlasting splendor dichotomy, I'll bet we want to start to see more and more fall into the, the category of everlasting splendor, which means they need to know God. They need to get to know him. What about how we see ourselves? Since we are immortals, how do we view ourselves? What does this mean for us? We're having just a really lousy day. We all have those, right? Remember that your immortal helps. It makes that lousy day seem like a blip and more bearable. Prayer helps with this. God told us what to do for a reason. When you realize that you are immortal and are talking to the source of your immortality, your eternal father, whatever insanity this world brings, hell's in comparison. For me at work, I have times that try my nerves and people that really make no sense whatsoever. And Jenny can tell us, I walk away from my desk and I'll usually end up ranting to her. And this is when I've lost perspective on things and things get to me. But it does help to pray. When you start off praying by knowledge of who God is, how much of a privilege it is taught to create the universe, and you realize there's so much more to our lives in these silly meetings, these silly things that happen. Those folks that drive you nuts, fall into perspective. The blood pressure lowers back down to a reasonable level as you can deal with things. God knew what he was doing when he gave us the privilege of prayer. In another perspective, in reality helps us deal with the physical ailments that afflict this physical vehicle we're in right now. This last week or two, I've had something weird going on with my ear that I couldn't hear out of it. And my hearing on one side was no good. The other bugging Jeannie because she had to repeat things on the other side, I admit it got to me too. I may be terrible at music, but I really enjoyed listening to music. I love hearing, like Brother Carlos was sorry singing his it's great to be able to hear a song. When I work, I like to put on some headphones and listen to music. Zone out, get in the move, and just kind of keep bear, go through things. Now, putting on the headphones reminds me that something's not quite right. <laughs> it's not the same. It puts a new perspective on, on doing that when you have only one headphone to use and one ear isn't working. Instead of blocking the world around you, you get reminded that something's, something's not right. It helps you remember that we are immortals, and this mortal coal won't last forever. My ear is an annoyance, but it will heal. No matter what happens, anything physical is only temporary. We have lots of folks with physical issues in this congregation. Just look at the prayer list on the back of the bulletin, you can see it's taken up almost the whole back page. You can tell that. It helps to be part of this family, as there are members of this congregation that have things going on constantly. To talk to them, you'd never know it. There are members in this congregation you can tell are focused on eternity. You can tell they don't let things get to them. And this and other congregations, I've met some of the toughest immortals I could ever imagine. For example, one immortal that I met in Georgia, Rich Lindsay. He's in constant back pain on this earth, but he doesn't use drugs for the pain. He's learned to keep his mind busy and to deal with it. I don't know how, but he's, he's figured it out. He's also an incredibly long, strong Christian. Even though he's in pain constantly, when you talk to him, he gives some great advice. He has those moments where he, he can focus on you and he really focus on you. And you can always tell, just like Jesus, his advice is focused toward eternity. Now, I could have just as easily used an example from this congregation. There's some incredibly strong immortals here. But, and it is a, a privilege to be part of this family and to know some incredible immortals among us. I love every one of you. As you go by this short path of your life, remember the perspective of God and his timeline on things. If we help, it will help to remember who we are, who the person we're interacting with, and what our focus should always be. Jesus gave an example to follow. We need to try to stay as close to that example as we can. When we realize that we and everyone we meet is an immortal soul, created by God, and intended for incredible glory, We'll be able to realize what is meant when we say we have never talked to a mere mortal. 
Every one of us has an immortal soul, and that is who we're talking to. God intended and wants it to become an eternal splendor, a magnificent child of God. Our choices determine if we live up to how God wants us to be. Our aim is to be led as many people as we can know about what God wants us to be, so as many of us as possible as those mortal souls we meet can join us. It is a great aim for ourselves and everyone that we meet. If you've not been baptized and would like to reserve a spot in your eternal splendor as a child of God, now or any time is a good time to be baptized. Water can always be found. Also, if there's anything that you need to let the congregation know, you can use the prayers of the congregation. Please let us know as we sing the invitation song. <laughs>